This is the place where NFL legends live on and share their stories. This is the place for our Spotlight on the Positive segment, sharing what's good in the world of sports. This is also the place for the NFL Alumni Association and the Gridiron Grades. This place I speak of, Thursday Night Tailgate. Let's say hello to your hosts, Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Guys, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight on Thursday Night Tailgate, your home for interviews and conversations with legends, players, and coaches from around the NFL. Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari here to do our best to brighten up the next couple of hours for you. TNT is brought to you by the great folks over at Kyven Foods, Coastal Orthopedics, the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory, and our wonderful friends over at the NFL Alumni Association and the Gridiron Greats Assistance Fund. Tonight, Bob and I, we've got some great guests and some great stories coming your way. First up, we'll be joined by former Bengals, uh, Vikings, and uh, Panthers defensive back and TNT Hall of Famer Leonard Wheeler. At the bottom of the hour, former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins will join us just like he does every single week here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Following Tony, we'll be joined by Houston Oilers Hall of Fame guard Bruce Matthews, and Bruce has a great book out titled Inside the NFL's First Family, and it's available and has a five-star rating on Amazon.com. Please go check that out. In hour number two, we'll get a return visit from uh, former Steelers kicker Jeff Reed and former Broncos and Giants linebacker Michael Brooks as well. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, so sit back, relax, let us take your mind off everything else going on in your life for the next couple of hours. But first, let's bring in my co-host, Mr. Bob Lazari. Bob, how are you tonight, my friend? There he is. (laughs) <laughs> all kinds of trouble trying to get in on the switchboard huh oh wow well try the regular number no dice but you know good to hear your voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah brutal trying to get you through i don't know I'm, I'm seeing some switchboard issues on our end as well so no worries glad to have you here so welcome to the show bob Oh, I'm sorry about that, Chris, but yeah, I um, I don't know if our guests will have the same trouble or what, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how this goes, my friend. Yeah, hopefully not. So, Bob, as uh, as I, you know, we we went through the intro and uh, we thanked all of our sponsors for being a part of the show tonight, and um, uh, what, you know, certainly glad to get you you know get you going here. So, one of the things that uh, you know. Uh, you know, as we were kicking off the show, one of the things that, you know, is, uh, if I've been trying to figure out for a very long time was, you know, something to do to brand our very first segment where we go around the league with you and get your thoughts on some of the big NFL stories of the week. So, you know, I, I took to our Facebook friends, right, for uh, segment title suggestions. Yes. And we got several really good <laughs> ones, you know, but uh, I know you prefer the, the simple and the classic. You know, our friend John Ames suggested Bob's take, and that's the way – that you wanted to go. I was sort of leaning towards one that our friend Holly Tower suggested, which was Bob Lazari's take or BLT, which, you know, I thought could go a number of different ways every week. And nice. uh, that was a really good suggestion. <laughs> Kelly Hanna had a nice suggestion for Bob's sake. I thought that was another really good, uh, really good suggestion. But you like the simple and the classic. Hey, uh, you know, they're all, I will, uh, thank goodness for creative friends, right, Chris? I mean, we could go any way we want with that. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, just make it simple. We just don't want to get crazy like, you know, Bob's view of the world on uh, football, this, that. But uh, I hear what you're saying. Those are all good things. And, you know, if it comes down to it, put it in a hat. But, uh, yeah, maybe tonight Bob's take, right? Exactly. So here we go, right? And in, in our inaugural Bob's take segment, Bob, I have you know a lot of things that I wanted to get your take on tonight with, you know, free agency opening today at, at 4 o'clock. You know, one of the big things, right, right out of the shoe, right, right before four o'clock, the Cleveland Browns and the Houston Texans pulled off a, a you know, what I can only categorize as a stunning trade. It's in, you know, example number 2142, why the Browns are the Browns, Bob. So the Texans, right, traded Brock Osweiler to Cleveland plus a second round pick, which will be the 25th selection in the second round and a sixth round pick. And all they get in exchange is the Browns' fourth-round draft pick. But, you know, make no mistake here, Bob. This move was so that the Texans could dump Osweiler and the, the ridiculous contract that they signed him, you know, to, you know, dump that off on the Browns, probably likely to make room 
on their roster and in uh, under the cap uh, to to trade for uh, Tony Romo or sign him, depending on what the Cowboys do. I hear I'm hearing on one side that the Cowboys are going to release Romo, the other side they're talking about still trying to trade him. So one of those things is probably going to happen. He's probably going to be a Texan. Now the upside, if you're a Browns fan, is they will have three picks now in the second round. Their own at the top of the round, plus the the Titans pick from a previous trade, and now which was the 20th pick in the second round, and now the Texans pick, which is the 25th pick in that round. So in total, the Browns are going to have, you know, they got the number one overall pick, they got the number 12 pick, and now three picks, you know, in the second round. So five out of the top 57 picks are going to go to the Browns. Now we know the Browns haven't made a good draft pick since the Carter administration. So those pick, those picks are likely to go bad, but you know, so that you're going to end up with Brock Osweiler and that contract, you know, in an annual thank you note from the Houston Texans. But Bob, your thoughts on this trade. Oh, well, Chris, it's it's got so many uh, ways you can look at it. It's it's almost like a mini soap opera going on because uh, it's it's funny, you know. When you make a trade, you you always think that the teams are doing what's best for both teams. I mean, let's face it. I mean, like you had said, the main thing was the Texans dumping that salary. Ironically, Chris, one year ago today. March 9th is when they signed Osweiler to that insane contract. And you and I were probably here one year ago tonight talking about how crazy that was and how it might come back to bite him. And you give this guy $18 million a year uh, just from not much from what you've seen. Uh, it was uh, – you and I were both say, saying this is this is crazy. Where Where is the money going in this league? But – you're right. There's no secret. I think the Texans want Romo. Romo might have a couple years left, Chris. They think he would fit in nice there, and they're not that far from being a very, very good team. They think Romo would be the piece. You can get him in there, and uh, again, uh, so the happiest people in the world tonight are the Texans, Chris. Now, the Browns, <laughs> like you said, they've made some crazy, crazy moves over the year they just can't seem to get it together and and you know what the funny thing is as much as you can feel sorry for a guy that's making 18 million dollars a year they don't really want osweiler they want the value that might be uh in here for what they're going to do they're actually willing to pay uh half of that salary to somebody to probably they're already shopping this guy chris so it is the most wild thing i've seen in a long time uh, so the Browns, uh, you, you're going to have guys, and, 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 and there's no secret that they're interested in a younger guy like Garoppolo. And, and we've talked about how New England might be uh, not too eager to give him up because of his talent, of his uh, just being there behind Brady, very good backup. But they think he's a good guy to lead a franchise. And now – Putting together all this stuff that the Browns will have, draft picks, this and that, that's probably the only way you may free up a guy like Garoppolo. You know New England can do wonders, Chris, if they get a bunch of second-round draft picks. That's like giving a magician some extra tricks, right? They just never make (laughs) bad moves. You give them a bunch of second-round draft picks, they'll be good for years and years and years. So um, it's a no, it's a no lose situation for a lot of these. The only thing that can be a nightmare, Chris, is if for some reason Cleveland cannot get rid of Osweiler. I mean, again, they've already told people here, we, we're going to give, we're going to pay half his salary. Just, just you know, give give us something. Um, they're they're looking to. I, I just can't see a young franchise. A building around this guy. You and I said he's a backup quarterback in this league and, and a very expensive one right now. And uh, there is there is word out there, Chris, that if things don't work out, they're going to release him anyway. So it's it, it's a wild situation. Um, man, I, I, you and I talk about a month from now, this will all probably have settled. It'll be fun to look back and, and see what we were talking about tonight. But um, I'll be uh, great. This is This is great stuff. And that's why I like free agency in the NFL uh, as, as much as any sport. Bob, another interesting uh, set of moves today. The Bucks uh, signed uh, Deshaun Jackson, who will now be paired with Mike Evans, giving you know Jameis Winston a pair of really great wide receivers to go along with you know emerging tight end Cameron Brait, you know who had a very good receiving year as a tight end. You know certainly came on late in the season. So the Bucks now are going to have a very formidable offense next year. 
another you know another move the Eagles you know make a uh, make a move to get a wide receiver they they end up signing Alshon Jeffrey so Bob curious to get your thoughts two you know two big name wide receivers on the move go to two different teams the Bucks look like they really help themselves the Eagles give themselves another you know a nice wide receiver target your thoughts on these two guys well, Deshaun Jackson, Chris, if you look at his career stats, uh, he, when he plays uh, 14 or more games, he'll get 1,000 yards. And this is a guy that's led the league, I believe, two or three times in yards per catch. I mean, uh, this past year he was at 18 yards per catch um, and only had 56 receptions. So this guy, he's a big game player. There's no question about it. There's been issues, uh, off the field issues, uh, maybe some of his, uh, his ties to, uh, some not so nice people, et cetera. That's, that's to be determined by, uh, whoever's team he's on. But, uh, Tampa Bay thinks enough of him and of Jameis Winston's ability to get him the ball that they figure, hey, guys, 30, 31 years old may have a couple more good, good years left, Chris, if he can play those 14 games. Again, he's got to stay on the field and, and you're right with Evans. That will be a very, very formidable duo, and that's another team that might be a player or two away from uh, really, you know, going far in a playoff. So uh, for them, it was kind of good. A guy like Jeffrey, Chris. I mean, there's a guy, you know, another talented guy, um, and, and you, you got to, he, he, hey, he's a, he's a guy that uh, can definitely catch the ball. He's he's been around uh, four or five years now. And, uh, again, uh, when this guy can play your four, 15, 16 games, he's going to be at uh, 80 to 90 catches and, uh, 15 yards per reception for his career. Very talented guy, uh, very big man. Reminds me a lot, Chris, of our good friend Moose, Moose and Muhammad, uh, that kind of guy. This guy is actually, I think, a little bigger. I mean, so he's a, he's a big man, very physical receiver, a little, and that's the total opposite. From Deshaun Jackson, but a uh, good pickup for them, and uh, hey, it's working always. Very well paid man, too. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I'm really interested to see what this does for the Bucks offense. You know, they're you know, keeping pace with the Atlanta Falcons in the NFC South now. You know, a pair of great wide receivers and a really good tight end, a couple of good running backs on that roster, and now mm-hmm. Jameis Winston, obviously, as well. So it's, it could be a shootout between the Falcons and the Bucks. It should be a lot of fun to watch. Bob, one more thing be, uh, before we get to our first first guest, Leonard Wheeler, who's hanging on the line. Bob, th- this week the Rams made a move to you know go back to the future, if you will, with respect to their uniforms. They went back to the days of the fearsome foursome with the blue and white helmets and the all white uniforms. Do you think this is going to help them sort of patch you know into the old spirit of the Rams now back in L.A.? It's got it, Chris. Uh, you know, you see a lot of these new teams that come out with these new logos. And I remember the Giants for a while. They they came out with a different logo that was different than what we had seen. It just did not look right, Chris. You had a different feeling watching the team. But I saw a preview of those uniforms online this week, and it, it brought me all the way back to your, your guys like uh, Willie Ellison and Jack Snow and Roman Gabriel. And uh, Lawrence McCutcheon, I mean, I was looking at those those uniforms. It just looks right, Chris. <laughs> you know, if you if you go back, you know, I guess there's a there's a, a pleasure in in being old, right? Uh, we can look back on some of those uniforms, and uh, and and really take us back. And I, I think for those people our age or more who remember, uh, it is great. But just to see those uniforms, we had thought we would see the end of it. We didn't know if we'd ever see a team back there. So uh, I think it's great. I can't wait to see these guys in action. Yeah, and I agree. I'm looking forward to seeing these guys play in those unis. All right, so there you have it. Bob's take for this week. And uh, we'll get that segment going for you every single week now here on TNT. All right, everyone, like we do here every week on Thursday Night Tailgate, we want to tell our military personnel listening in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network, thank you. Thank you for doing what you do, you do to protect all of us in our way of life. To our broader audience, we sincerely thank you for being a part of the show as well, and we hope you'll join us in thanking our brave men and women who are out there serving in every branch of our military. If you happen to see one of our military personnel out in your daily life, wherever you might be, grocery store in the airport a restaurant just out and about please stop for a moment and tell those folks thank you they are our true heroes we also want to thank our veterans for your service and the sacrifices that you and your families have made for us over the years we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you 
Big thank you as well to Sean Cruz and all the great folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. We are so honored that Thursday Night Tailgate is a part of your network. You can find our show by going online to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And veterans, please continue to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org for news and articles that I'm sure you're going to find both interesting and beneficial to you. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. TNT is sponsored by Kyvan Foods. NFL star Reggie Kelly brings the authentic flavor of traditional Southern cooking to market with his Kyvan Foods products. Made with the finest ingredients, Kyvan Foods invites you to appreciate the goodness of the exceptional flavors of their salsas, sauces, apple butter, and other fine products. Make Kyvan items a part of your tailgating needs, whether you're, you know, you're at home home gating or you're at your know, baseball season starting up now, right? So you'll be tailgating out at the baseball games. The taste of their products is absolutely unbeatable. Available through Walmart.com, at select Kroger stores, or online by going to Amazon or Kyvan site itself at Kyvan82.com. And Kyvan is spelled K-Y-V-A-N. TNT is also sponsored by Dr. Peter Candelora and the great team that he has there at Coastal Orthopedics. Folks, if you're an athlete, a weekend warrior, or anybody dealing with injuries or discomfort, whether it's in your knees, your shoulders, your hips, or your other joints, don't just live with it. Do what other athletes do to get relief, and that is contact Dr. Peter Candelora because he can get you back to enjoying life. For more information or to schedule a consultation, visit them online at athleteinjuries.com. Baseball season, right? It's getting underway. Spring training games going on. If you love the game of baseball, you've got to go check out the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory. They were inducted into the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence Hall of Fame. The museum itself, very cool for everybody in the family because you get to go there and walk their live production line and see some of the 1.8 million bats that they make every year. And they've been doing it now for over 132 years. Don't miss the bat ball. You get to go in there and hold actual game-used bats from so many of the game's greatest legends. Guys like Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth, my hero growing up, Willie Stargell. To find out more information about the museum and to book your visit, go to sluggermuseum.com. All right, we've got our first guest, Leonard Wheeler, now joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line. And Leonard is a Thursday night tailgate Hall of Famer, former Bengals, Vikings, and uh, Panthers defensive back. Let me give you a little more on on Leonard's background. He was born in Toccoa, Georgia, which is about 90 miles northeast of Atlanta. Played his college ball at Troy University. He was a third-round draft pick by the Cincinnati Bengals in 1992 and played in the NFL from 92 to 99 with the Bengals, Vikings, and Panthers. After he retired, he served as the president of the Charlotte Retired Players Chapter of the uh, NFL Players Association. He's also on the former Players Board of Directors for the NFLPA. He is a national speaker for NFL Play 60. And Leonard was literally guest number 14 on this show (laughs) all the way back in December of 2011. And uh, we've always had so much fun every time Leonard has joined us over the years. He's uh, become a wonderful friend and a supporter of the show. And every time we finish our, our time with him, we emerge with big smiles on our faces. And we're excited to have him back with us again here tonight on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Leonard, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Ben. Chris and Bob, how are you guys doing? No, fantastic. Right. Leonard, how are you? Man, I am I am beyond blessed, Chris. Let me tell you what, but if I had your hand, I would trade mine in. That's why that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Leonard. So, oh, so Leonard, man. you know, I was looking around on your website, LeonardWheeler.com. Nice new website, new, nice new design. Talk Thank about uh, what's going on with you and on your site. Well, I'm going to definitely send you guys an updated resume. So much has changed um, uh, over the past years. You know, I'm I'm no longer on the former players board of directors. You know, I uh, uh, became a legends director uh, for the NFL regional director over the Central South. And uh, it's just been amazing working with my guys, man. And uh, working, you know, Troy and Tracy, Troy Vincent, Tracy Perman did an amazing job of creating a Legends community. I've been doing that. I've been doing my global executive coaching and speaking. Uh, I have Capital One event coming up on Monday and then another one next week in Plano, Texas. And uh, and Capital One is amazing. So the company that I'm able to really work with, man, continues continues to blow me away, to be honest with you. So you you sort of, you know, wet our whistle there. Talk about the Legends community and the work you're doing with those folks. So the Legends community was created over three and a half years ago 
for all former players. You know, we have over 20,000 former players, and over 20,000 former players have played in the NFL over the past 97 years. So what Troy and Tracy did was they created a program to where we can embrace, celebrate, educate all former players, connect them back to each other, back to their teams, and then back to the NFL. Because, you know, come on, guys, all of us grew up looking at the NFL and wanting to be one of those legends that we always admired. We wanted to one day play against those coaches and one day play against the best players in the NFL. Knowing that less than 1% play the game, it's important for us to make sure that we continue to understand that we can celebrate this game, that all of us really put our lives on the line to play. So those are just some of the things that we're doing with the Legends community. We had a chance to be at the Combine and to mentor a lot of the young guys, defensive backs, which is the best position on the field, but I might be a little biased. But and, and, to, and, and to really see and to really see that talent and uh, and create a legends community, the legends lounges. It's just it's amazing things, man, that's happening right now. So I'm happy that you guys are giving us a chance to be on the show and to talk about it. Absolutely. And anytime you got updates, Leonard, you know where we you know we want to hear it. So let us know. Yes, sir. Well, what? I have to say this: there's, there's another guy that I'm working with, uh, Portico to where with Bob Dennison, I'm going to have a chance to reach back out to you guys once we get up and running with that, and I'll be able to fill you in uh, once we get started up and running uh, with more data. All right. Well, we look forward to that. Okay. Leonard, I wanted to get your thoughts uh, about some stuff going on, you know, on the field, if you will, or in the game, you know, particularly Mm -hmm. there locally for you with the Carolina Panthers. And you go back and you look, you know, since the Super Bowl in, you know, 2000 of six, you know, 2016, things haven't gone really mm-hmm. well for the Panthers. You know, I thought they were going to be as good, if if not better, on offense last mm-hmm. season than they were in 2015 with, you know, Kelvin Benjamin coming back. I had some high expectations mm-hmm. for Delvin Funches. I thought, boy, you know, these, these guys are going to be dynamic, even more dynamic, and they led the league in scoring in 2015. But slipped down all the way down from 1st to 15th. What do you think happened? to the offense and did the loss of Josh Norman take a lot of the heart out of their defense? You know what? We've seen that happen year after year to where the football, you know, the, uh, the team that goes to the Super Bowl, they end up coming back. I mean, neither one of the teams made it back to the playoffs. You're talking about the Broncos or the Panthers. And so when you look at, when you look at things like that, of course, people say, okay, they imploded. You know, what happened to Josh Norman? have such an effect. Yeah, Josh Norman is a great talent. And so any defensive back, any defensive backfield that allows Josh Norman to leave, you're going to you're going to struggle in trying to replace that talent. Josh was still a young guy uh and really making some amazing plays and his leadership on and off the field, you know, uh, continues to ignite the men to want to play the game. And so, of course, yeah, the defensive backfield, they struggled a little because of that absence. But I think sometimes it's a little bit more than just one player leaving. I think sometimes it's really about the intrinsic communication or the lack thereof. And I don't know if the Panthers were able to really communicate in a way that that was related to victories. Right, it's obvious they didn't win the games, but I think they were in such close games, and they were losing a lot of games towards the end because of maybe some lack of days ago. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, you can't blame it all on the players because the coaches coach the game and the players make the plays. So it's it's really both sides that I think did not step up um, in 2017. Bob, questions for Leonard? Leonard, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, about all I can say is thanks for being you. It's a, it's an honor, and uh, let me, um, I'm going to ask you a question, Leonard, that I've asked a couple okay. of DBs since we last talked, and that's about the job of the referee these days, Leonard. We see so much, especially at the end of the season. I was watching a lot of playoffs, and, and you just saw so much wrestling and pushing on the part of the offensive wide receiver, and then you'd have a retaliation or just a little bit of a hold by a defensive back. 
and it, it just went back and forth, back and forth. Is this, is it got to the point, Leonard, where the job of an NFL referee, it's, it, it, it's getting so hard to, uh, to call who might be at fault and, uh, what really comprises a penalty? Well, first of all, Bob, I have to say this before I get into that. I'm looking yep. out for the DBs before I look out for the referees because sure. the job is hard for the DBs. Let me just tell you, I know it's hard for the referees. I have some, some referees who are great friends of mine that, that ref in the NFL, and their job mm-hmm. is hard because the rule continues to change, so they have to adapt to the rule. We get it, right? But the defensive backfield uh, has – must adapt as well. And what's happening is when I came in the league in 1992, we were able to harass guys off the line. I mean, we had a five-yard cushion to where we could – but let me just tell you, brother, it is very difficult to run backwards, play defense going down the field, and really think that you made a great play. And then to look around, and there's that yellow flag. The emotional – uh. I think just the emotional energy that it literally takes from you to where I just made a great play and then it's all of a sudden gone. That is really tough. And it becomes really tough for the defensive back coach. It becomes, it becomes tough for, for the entire team because you're talking about that third and 16, the referees have to make the call on the dime. And hopefully, you know, one thing that helps the referees is that they have replay, you know? So so sometimes even if they didn't make a great call, replay can sometimes, you know, rescue them. With the defensive backs themselves, it's tough, man. And like I said, maybe I'm speaking with a little bias because I'm very passionate about my defensive backs. You guys know this. Uh, but it is it is not a tough deal guarding receivers right now in the NFL going downfield. Yeah, from what I gather, Leonard, from what I've seen, it's it's almost as if the offensive guys, and we know the, these DBs are strong men too, but these guys are so physical, these receivers, that initial push-off is going to gain them space, and it's it's almost as if it's a defensive back. It's how much he responds uh, that either draws the penalty or not. It, it's gotten a little crazy to me, and, and I, I have a tendency to agree with you. I mean, the guys push off. And then uh, it's usually the second guy that gets caught. And I don't know what can be done about it. It's such a physical league. And uh, I I guess it's going to be status quo for a while, don't you think? No doubt about it. That's not going to change. And and look, the guys know that it's not going to change. And with everything in life, we know that things aren't going to change a lot of times. So we have to learn to adapt to the rules. Because there are going to be a set of rules in everything that we do. And if we don't adapt to those rules, we're going to be the ones missing out, not the others. So we have to adapt to the rules yeah. at play, and that's where we are right now. I also wanted to ask you, Leonard, uh, March 9th today. I was wondering, when back when you are playing in the 90s, uh, when March rolled around, I mean, you're, you're into the fifth or sixth week off from uh, the NFL what uh, would you be doing around March 9th? I mean, when did you really shut it down? How long did you shut it down before you started working out and everything? We get different uh, from different positions, different players, people with different age, uh, all have a different answers. Tell us what you did maybe approximately in the mid-90s around March. What would you be doing on a day like today, Leonard? I can just tell you the truth. I shut it down for maybe one week. That's it. I, wow. Wow. I was – because my mindset was somebody's outworking me. And if we don't have that mindset that somebody's outworking us, then we're going to make them, we're going to become complacent. And you know what? The NFL will literally stand not for long, right? And we're going to become complacent and somebody's going to take your spot. And with yeah. this game, there are so many great talents out there. And if we allow our guards to be down, by thinking that we that we haven't made the team, they one thing about this league, it's gonna move on without you, right? Mm-hmm. So there's not one player bigger than this league. So right now, guys, what I would be doing, I would have been working out today. Um, you know, I I always owned the companies when I played in the NFL, so I would be working out and I would be working. 
Those are the things in taking care of family. That's what I did back in the days. Work, work out, take care of family. Lennon, you talk about how the game's going to move on, you know, with or without you. And, and, and you've written a wonderful book called Beyond the Locker Room, Developing Your Game Plan for Life's Transitions. Talk about some of the stories that you heard while putting the book together, particularly regarding the difficulty that many players have in transitioning, you know, to life after the game. Because unlike guys like Peyton Manning, most players don't get to have the, the big press conference and, you know, announcing the retirement and, and all of those sorts of things, the hoopla that goes with that and, you know, ceremonially, mm-hmm. you know, get to move on to the, to the next uh, stage in their lives. Most guys just get cut. And then the phone just never rings again, and they wake up one day and realize, I guess I'm retired now. Right. And then and that's a great point. Whenever You know, there are a lot of guys that are bitter. And because we're either kicked out, asked to get out, or we just choose to, you know, or we're not asked back. You know, I mean, not everybody can leave the game like Peyton Manning or Ray Lewis to where they leave with that big Super Bowl ring, and they're like, you know, off on the parade, like you said. And let me just tell you, man, it is it is a – I had some great guys write in this book. I mean, I had Troy Vincent write in it, Hardy Nickerson. Uh, I mean, even Tracy Perlman, she she put – you know, she's been in the NFL uh, office for over 25 years. I had some great people that were able to sound off and talk about the real hard, dark part of transition. There are some parts of transition to where I call the dark hole, the black hole. Because you don't know when you enter in it, you don't know how deep it is, how wide it is. You just find yourself one day in that place, right, to where you can't see. And you're you're hoping for light. You've been praying for light. And what you have to do is you really have to remember that there are some more people out there that are surrounding you that can become your new team. And so I tell guys all the time is that we have to identify our new team. Because there are people out there that we can trust. And what happens is this, is that when we get released, we forget how to trust sometimes. You know, because we are a little upset. Well, very upset. We're bitter. And that's why, again, I go back to the Legends community. Why we created the Legends community. We know that guys are bitter. We can hide better than anybody, Bob. Man, we have to turn over rocks and, and bricks and more. I mean, we have to turn over a lot of things to find these guys because, we do hide, and we're really, really good at hiding our emotions from people. And, Leonard, you, you know, you talk about the black hole piece, right? And it's and it's not only the depression, right, because the phone has stopped ringing and, and the teams aren't calling you, but it's also the, all the others, like, you know, people stop inviting you to things. You know, suddenly, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I guess it's like, you know, I'm, you're no longer the celebrity. Mm-hmm. They're no longer needed. The game has moved on. We've moved on without you. Talk about the depression that sets in and because, you know, guys feel like they're just mm-hmm. you know, not wanted anymore. Well, I'm a transition coach for the NFL. And what that means is that we're, we're certified in the whole behavioral piece when it comes to suicide or depression, anxiety, anything dealing with behavior. And what happens is a lot of times is that when we do leave the game, man, Everybody sometimes stops getting invited. And every year, your worth as far as the celebrity part goes down, not your worth internally of who you are and who you believe you are, but who you are to the public, the public opinion as you as a celebrity, it starts to dwindle percentages every single year. And so what we have to do is is this, is that People are going to stop inviting you to things because you were a part of that part of their lives, right? There are so many different seasons of your life that we have to learn to embrace when we're transitioning and moving on because the depression piece is real, guys. Like, it's so real. And that's why we have so many transition coaches. We have Dwight Hoyer uh, in the NFL office who's working diligently in that area. You have Keith Elias. These guys are put there for a reason because they know that this is real. It's not something that you just ignore. And if you look around today, even with our young people, we're dealing with more depression and anxiety than we've ever dealt with in our entire life. We're dealing with more bullying and everything that we've ever dealt with in our life. And so 
Right now is the time for us not to ever ignore it, but to learn how to embrace it so that we can recognize it and deal with it. Leonard, before we let you go, remind our listeners how they, a, how they can get a copy of your book and check it out, and then follow okay. you, whether it's online or over social media. Well, first of all, I want to just say thank you. to These guys are so amazing. If you guys are listening, I want you to make sure that you embrace these two men because they do so much for the community of sports just all across, not just football, but they embrace people. And I just love you guys, man. I just want to just make sure that I let the listeners know that. Um, you guys can get in touch with me at leonardwheeler.com. Uh, you can, uh, and you know, you can sign up for coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, you have me come as a speaker. You can also, uh, get the book from amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, uh, booksamillion.com. And, um, like I said, guys, I'm just, I'm, I'm blessed that you asked me to be on and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we thank you very much for that, Leonard. You know you're one of our all-time favorites. That's why you're in our Hall of Fame. So thank you so thank much you, for your time, Leonard. We, you know, as you have things with the Legends community, you know we want to hear about them. So please, you know, keep us updated yes, and uh, come back and join us again real soon, my friend. Thank you guys so much. Be blessed tonight. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. Take thank care, you. Leonard. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That is uh, former Bengals, Vikings, and Panthers defensive back Leonard Wheeler. And, uh, Bob, you can, it's, there's no, no mystery why he's in our Hall of Fame. That's right, Chris. And, and it's no mystery that he is very, very dogged about helping former players. And, and it's become an epidemic, Chris. We know that a lot of these guys, either because of injury, not having the uh, the education to fall back on. There's so many reasons why a lot of these guys hide and, and get left off or get forgotten. And uh, you need guys like Wheeler, and, and we got a lot of guys that come on this show and are, and are definitely <clears throat> devoted to doing that. And nobody does it quite like Leonard. We've had him on the TV show up here. He's he's very free with his time, very generous with his time. And every time he speaks, Chris, uh, you know, everyone listens because – he does it in such an eloquent way and uh, makes so much common sense. And that's why he's in our Hall of Fame. That's correct. Mm-hmm. All right. We've got our next guest, Tony Collins, hanging on the line. We'll get to Tony on the other side of this station identification. This is Christine Lisi, and you're listening to Thursday Night Tailgate, where NFL stars go to tell their stories with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line in his regular weekly time slot is former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins. Hey, Tony, how are you tonight, my friend? Hi, Tony. I'm doing fantastic. How you doing, Chris and Bob? Ah, really Great, good. Thank, thank you, Tony. So, Tony, today's a big day, right? A lot of free agency, a lot of player movement starting to happen. I was surprised to see your Patriots make a trade for uh, tight end Dwayne Allen from the Colts. I'm guessing Martellus is Bennett, you know, his one year in New England, that's that's probably over and done with. You surprised to see that as well? I, I was, I was. I, I, I thought Bennett would come back and, and help us out some more, but I guess, you know, uh, just not working out. So, Allen's a good good tight end, man. I, he, I think he's going to help us a lot. You know, another another free agent move, Bob and I were talking about this last week, but, you know, the, the Patriots let, you know, Dante Hightower – go or at least to go investigate what he can get in free agency you know but you know so you've seen you know Dante Hightower now you know gone potentially Jamie Collins was traded away Chandler Jones traded away so all of their sort of high profile linebackers over the last three years are gone now is is this just another example of Belichick saying you know we're not going to pay anyone high dollars in free agency and it doesn't matter if you like it or not because we'll get someone to replace you and we'll just move on well, you know, I don't know if it's it's, it's totally that, or if it's if it's, it's something to do with them them with the system. I, I you know I, I I know for a fact if Belichick wants a wants a player to stay on his team, uh, he'll he'll make sure that player stays. And so you just you just never know uh, the bottom line to it, what it is. And I know we we don't the Patriots don't don't pay a lot of players a lot of high money. I mean. They gave the defensive back a, 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 a good bunch of money. The, the new guy who I think they picked him up from Buffalo or something, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, you, you don't see a, too many big, big contracts from New England. 
But the other thing is, is, is the guys uh, making sure they fit into the system. Now, you know, I, I think Hightower has been there for a few years, so I, I, can, I, I can't believe he doesn't fit into the system. But you just never know uh, the bottom line when it comes down to a player and, and money and, and the system. Bob, questions for Tony? Tony, I wanted to ask you about uh, Adrian Peterson and your gut feeling. Uh, we're hearing that, you know, he has down to a few teams such as Seattle. I know the Giants were taking a look at him. Second big knee injury, Tony. You've had him. Uh, this guy, from what we hear from other people, they say he's a freak and can come back. Uh, he's actually been mentioned of coming to New England, He, he you know, to win a Super Bowl. He might consider it. Uh, first of all, Tony, do you think he has anything left? And uh, do you think whoever he goes to will be uh, helped immensely by his presence? I mean, I, I really think he does. I mean, if he gets to the right system as far as uh, a, a good running team, a good offensive line, a healthy offensive line, Adrian Peterson, you know, he still can uh, put give you a 1,000, maybe 1,500 yards, I, I believe. Uh, he, you know, he's a freak, man. He's a freak of nature. I think uh, one of the, the injuries that he's had and how quickly he's come back. But I, I really think he has a, a, at least another two, 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 two more, two more good years. I, I believe if he can stay healthy. Mm. And Tony, we had just talked to our friend Leonard Wheeler about uh, helping ex-players and everything, and we know how much, uh, and we we plug it a lot how you're uh, you're helping kids. And but I'm sure what goes under the radar is uh, maybe ex-players who you've talked to. You know that guys are some just being in the league like you were. A lot of your friends uh, were probably in positions of uh, just uh, hiding and, and and embarrassment for whatever reason. It's it's a tough tough life for the guys that played those three or four years, Tony, and maybe didn't make the headlines all the time, and then they go into retirement and kind of disappear. It's, it's not an automatic uh, step from football to the broadcast booth or, or to some kind of. Uh, Fame. But talk to us, Tony, about uh, maybe guys or no names in particular, but what is it like talking to ex-players who just don't want to come forward and ask for help? Well, you, you got you got to understand, Bob, is that when you say a player played two or three years in the league, but guess what? Mm-hmm. That, that, that player that played two or three years in the league all his life, ma- ma- the majority of all his life, he's been – Kind of like put on a little pedestal because he he was a, he was the best best player on the team in Pop Warner. He was mm-hmm. the best player on the team when he was in on, on the JV. Now he's the best player on varsity. Uh, he goes off to college and everybody everybody loves him. And, and and then he plays two or three years in the league. Now all those years of everybody loving you and everybody cheering for you and everybody telling you how great you are. <laughs> and now mm-hmm. it all comes to an end. And you can't play that game anymore. <laughs> it, it, I'm gonna tell you, mm-hmm. man. It, it's it, it's a tough situation, and you just can't look at those guys who played three years or four years or five years. These guys have been playing. All they know is football. That's that's all we that's all we knew. That's all I knew was mm-hmm. just to play football and and try to make a lot of money, to take care of my family, and, and that was it. Um, I think the NFL is doing a great job now of uh, trying to help players to, to transition. But there, there was no transition back when, uh, you know, when we were playing. As far as anybody trying to help us and let us know, no, you, you gotta look for, look towards this. You gotta look towards that. You gotta make sure you're saving your money. You gotta make sure you're doing this. You gotta make sure you're doing that. But it, the biggest thing I truly believe is now you don't have nobody in your corner cheering for you anymore, and, and it's a tough situation if you don't. You got your your, your feet planted and got a, a good foundation without a good foundation man and even sometimes you you, you may still have a good foundation but you just it, it that transition is just such a shocker to you now you you know you don't get the interviews nobody nobody wants to talk to you no more they don't invite you to things anymore it, it, it's, a, it's a tough situation if you're not if you're not ready for it tony one more before we let you go and we, and we talked last week you know, about your off-season workouts and, and that sort of thing. You talk about just a moment ago with Bob, you know, Adrian Peterson and what a freak, you know, athlete, you know, he is. You know, when you were playing, were there guys, you know, that, you know, 
in you know they were in shape and they looked really good and all that sort of stuff but but you know they they weren't doing the things you know they weren't eating right they weren't in the gym that much but they're still out there killing it just guys who were freakishly good athletes and in freakishly good shape <laughs> though it, they weren't doing the things that the other guys were doing to get there and let me tell you something um god i can't think of the titans name my 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 first year that was uh god he was Russ Francis. Russ Francis. Russ Francis. Russ Francis yeah. was there my rookie season, right? Um, and I, you know, you know, we're, we're working out and everything. Russ Francis does not even look towards the weight room. He, I, I, I the whole year, you know, doing, you know, train in training camp, you know, we lift weights and everything. Russ Francis will come in the weight room, you know, because everybody, everybody has to lift weight at your position. But he'll come in the weight room and lay down on the, on, on the. Uh, on the on the bench on the bench press, <laughs> but but he's but when the, when the, when the game starts, he's one of the, he was one of the best tight ends to play the game. But he does not does not go in the weight room. I mean, to me that to me that was so shocking to, to see that, and that was for the whole entire year. He never he never worked out, and actually he never practiced either. He would, he would never <laughs> practice during the week, <laughs> but he would play on Sunday. <laughs> so that wow. you know, that I, I, I'm pretty sure there's more guys like that, but uh, I think I think now with with all the technology that they have now, if you're if you're not training, if you're not up to par with some of these guys, man, you 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 could you could get seriously hurt uh, if you if you're not if you're not toned because a lot of these guys are are, are machines, man. If they, if they hit you. And you're not ready to be hit with somebody like that. You 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 could get hurt. So I think a lot of the guys now are, are are really training. You really probably don't probably don't see that anymore. I remember going. I remember my, when I made it to the Pro Bowl, uh, my third year in the league, and I'm coming into the Pro Bowl into the locker room at one of the practices. Jack Lambert is in there smoking a cigarette. I was like, this is this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it was back then, man. But I don't think I don't think nobody smokes cigarettes anymore in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, before we let you go, remind our listeners about all the great things you're doing trying to help kids go to college. Tony Collins Foundation dot com and Tony Collins Speaks dot com. Go to the website and see what we're doing. Get a book. Every book that we sell helps a kid go off to college. That's great stuff, Tony. Thank you so much for being here again this week, my friend. We look forward to catching up with you again next week. In between now and then, all the best you and your family, Tony. Absolutely. You guys have a fantastic weekend. All right. Take care, Tony. Thank you. I just former Patriots Pro Bowl running back Tony Collins and uh, and Bob is, you know, it's interesting. He's he's, he's alluded to Russ Francis in the past, talk a little bit about him, but uh, you know, what a great tight end Russ Francis was back in the day. And to think that, uh, you know, the most he did in a weight room was uh, lay on a bench is, uh, is unbelievable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, and these days it's changed so much because, I mean, you know, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Francis, for those who remember, every, everything now, of course, is about Gronkowski and deservedly so, but Russ Francis back in the day, uh, yeah, as Tony said, when it came to playing uh, game day, he was always ready, very good target, very good hands, and, and a great player. All right, we're going to get to our next guest, Houston Oilers Hall of Fame guard Bruce Matthews, and we'll do so on the other side of this station identification. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcons tight end, and you're listening to TNT, Thursday Night Tailgate. Brace yourself for the explosion. And now joining us on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Hall of Fame guard Bruce Matthews. Let me give you some more background on Bruce. He's from Raleigh, North Carolina, played his college ball at USC, where he was an All-American his senior season and won the Morris Trophy for being the then Pac-10's top offensive lineman. He was a first-round draft pick, the ninth overall selection by the Houston Oilers in 1983, and he played in the league from 83 all the way to 2001, all with the Houston Oilers, who would later become the Tennessee Titans toward the end of Bruce's career. Bruce played every position along the offensive line and was named to 14 Pro Bowls and was named All-Pro seven times. He was also a part of the NFL's 1990s All-Decade team. He was a first ballot Hall of Famer inducted in 2007, and we are honored to have him with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Good evening, Bruce. Chris and Bob here. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you having me on. 
so Bruce, I got to I got to ask you, you know, looking back at, you know, your time at USC, but how does a kid from Raleigh, North Carolina end up playing his college ball all the way on the other coast at USC? Well, we moved to Southern California when I was in fourth grade, and then pretty much from there on, although we bounced around a little bit, uh I I went to school out in Southern California, then my older brother Clay went there and um, if they would have me, then I was all in, ready to go. So it, it was a real easy decision for me. We ended up only living about 25 minutes from SC. So, uh, loved my time at SC, played with some amazing players and really looked fondly on that time. And as I was sort of looking back over, you know, some of the, you know, some of the games that you got to be a part of there and some of the seasons that you had, you know, 1979, great season. You guys finished 11-0-1, and, and the one was a, a tie against Stanford. And I'm always interested to find out, Bruce, do you, you guys would go on that season to beat number one ranked Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. But do you look back on that season as a great success, or do you look at it as a national championship that got away if you had just beaten Stanford? Well, yeah, I definitely, uh, Looking back, think we should have won the na- the national championship. We had amazing talent. Um, you know, I'm a freshman. It's my first experience with college football. So I think this is how it is in college football. But we, just on the offensive line at SC, we had six future number one draft picks. Um, Anthony Munoz, Brad Buddy, uh, Keith Van Horn, Roy Foster, myself, and Don Mosbar are our running backs were both Heisman winners, Marcus Allen and Charles White. Our defensive secondary uh, were uh, safeties, Dennis Smith and Ronnie Lott, cornerbacks, uh, Joy Browner and future head coach Jeff Fisher. So we were loaded, and uh, we were up 21 nothing against uh, Stanford at halftime at the Coliseum. Um, Elway was a freshman, but it was uh, – Turk Schoner, who led the comeback. And, um, you know, like I said, I was a true freshman, and I basically played the second half of almost every game. And it, it was just an outstanding experience for me. And um, to be surrounded by such great players, it really set the tempo for what I hoped to accomplish in college. And, and to that end, Bruce, as you mentioned, you know, Ronnie Lott, Jeff Fisher, Chip Banks, Ross Brown, all those great players on defense. What was it like for you on offense going up against those guys at practice? Well, that was the thing. We practiced full speed. It was very competitive. Um, I won't say that the games were a break, but the the competition at practice, um, I can't even remember what days practice, Tuesday and Wednesday, I guess it would be in college was so physical that, uh, you know, you were getting great work even though uh, you were just in practice and um, played against some great young players who were like on scout teams and things like that. So it's needless to say the talent was amazing. They had just won the national championship in 78 and then uh, were picked, we were picked number one in 79 and, um, just yeah crazy talent Bob questions for Bruce yes Bruce and Chris and I have talked uh extensively about that 83 draft and it me it's just you look at the names again six hall of famers and, and some some more incredible names among those people but uh, coming out of a class like that, uh, Bruce, what was your ex- expectations on draft day uh, as far as a, a California guy where you're hoping to stay put or go to anywhere where you could probably start right away? I, My dad played in the NFL. Uh, my older brother, Clay, was with the Browns. He just finished his fifth year. Um, so, And I, I was a huge fan of the league growing up. And mm-hmm. to me – I mean, I had no expectations about anything. I I just wanted to be a part of it. I didn't care where I went. Um, Really, the first thing that I got exposed to when I I thought maybe I could be drafted high, back then we had three scouting combines because they hadn't unified all the scouting yet. So we had to do the same stuff uh, every two weeks. We did it in Tampa, Detroit, and Seattle. And at the first uh, scouting combine, 
uh, a guy came up to me and introduced himself as the new head coach of the New York Giants, and it was Bill Parcells. And he goes, hey, Bruce, and he introduced himself. I, I didn't know who he was. And he goes, hey, I just want to tell you, if you're still there, we're going to take you at number 10. And my jaw hit the floor because, I mean, I, I thought maybe I was a second-round pick or something like that. But to hear that from Coach Parcells, it, it really uh, it was really a flattering and humbling um, experience for me. And I've always been kind of a big Bill Parcells guy because he always told me they were going to take me number 10. But uh, the Oilers took me number nine, and, um, you know, I didn't look back. Bruce, you mentioned your uh, your brother, Clay. And, and Clay, God rest my father's soul, he loved your brother as much as any player I think he ever watched because my father was just into those old Cleveland teams and the old municipal stadium and the old uh, – just those old kind of lunch pail kind of guys. And there was nobody – quite that did it like your brother and played for so long you guys it's amazing the two of you had such careers that mirrored each other as far as longevity but uh as as far as clay your brother and uh again he passed a lot of it down to his son they they just seem so much alike they have the motor that does not stop running but uh just a very very tough player who uh my goodness i I just smile when i think your brother yeah i To this day, he's still my favorite player of all time. Um, (laughs) Like I said, he was. I grew up wanting to be like my brother. I tried to play linebacker. I didn't have the skill set to be it, but um, you know, I I I can uh, talk about my brother all day. He Mm -hmm. he played the position, and I agree with everything you said. But he was the consummate linebacker. He could play over the tight end. He could cover the tight end. He could play against the run. He could be the open edge um, uh, rush guy. He could play inside backer. He was the nickel linebacker covering the likes of James Brooks for the Bengals back in the day. He he then put his hand down on the ground, became an end, uh, and passed for a situation, was very productive. And it's really been a big disappointment to me that my brother hadn't gotten a lot more consideration for the Hall of Fame. Um, whenever I talk to Hall of Famers, they are in agreement, 100% agreement, saying that he deserves to be in there. And I, I think in a lot of ways his versatility kind of – he's paying a price for that because, yeah, you got other guys that specialize in certain areas, whether it be rush in the past or maybe coverage. But my brother did him, did it all – did it all very well and did it all very well for a long time. And I, I know I'm biased, but I think he should be in Canton, no question. Totally agree. And Bruce, you, you played against your brother, you know, for you know for you know many years, you, twice a year for 11 years, because back then the Oilers and the Browns were in the the AFC Central together. What were those battles like? And did you ever have to get on to any of your own teammates who might have stepped over the line trying to block him, whether <laughs> trying to cut him or chop block him? No, uh, well, first off, let me say what a special thing it was for me as as a little brother and to have the guy that you idolize being on the other team. And then to to see him every play, basically. I mean, granted, there were times he wasn't my assignment, so I'd lose track of him. But I remember early on in my career uh, just the pride that I would feel. And um, I'd have to cover up my mouth to cover the smile. Uh, our offense coordinators would be talking about the Browns defense and um, naturally my brother came up and you know we got to deal with this match these guys very versatile blah 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 and it was something as a young guy it it was the neatest experience of my life and you talked about uh, playing at the old uh, Cleveland Stadium on the lake there that that has always been my favorite place to play And, and it had so much to do with as a young kid coming out there on the field, and I'd see all those 57 jerseys in the stands, the old homemade uh, um, bed sheet signs about my brother and stuff. And I, I loved it when the the Dog Pound fans would give me crap. Hey, you need to come up here and play with your brother. And um, I just date the experience up. We ended up playing like uh, 23 times, I think it was. And uh, it was a very close – 
I counted it a few times, but I can't ever remember. It was either 11 and 12 or 12 and 11. But, uh, yeah, like for me, yeah, I played on some bad Oiler teams, especially early in my career. And that, that opportunity against my brother twice a year was, you know, it, it wasn't a Super Bowl, but it was very special. And Bruce, you know, you played with or for Mike Munchak in Houston, you know, for many years. And, and after the 2013 season, Titans finished 7-9. and nine. Bud Adams wanted Munchak, who was the head coach at the time, to, to let go of, you know, most of his assistant coaches. And Munchak refused to do that, refused to do it to you and to other, you know, several of the other guys. And he ended up parting ways with the Oilers, you know, after having been a member of that franchise for 31 years. How did you feel about how that whole thing unfolded? Well, I wasn't surprised. You know, Munch and I are best friends, and um, I had the opportunity to play 11 years next to him, or at least by him in some shape or form. Sometimes I played on his left side or his right side. He always stayed at left guard. I moved around. But, uh, you know, he the guy is rock solid, and that's the type of man he is. That's the type of player he was. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Um, he was a great player. He was a great offensive line coach. And I really felt that I played some of my best football when he took over as the offensive line coach. And um, I, and he was the same way as a head coach. Unfortunately, Mr. Adams died during that 2013 uh, season. And then, you know, his heirs didn't have much of a clue of how to run an NFL franchise. I think, uh, I'm thinking that some owner is going to figure it out and give Munch another head coaching job. But, um, yeah, like you said, he was told he had to make these personnel moves. And, you know, that isn't the way Munch is. He goes, you hired me to do a job, and I'm going to do it the way that I think it should be done, not just please you. Because he could have gotten an extension. And, um, you know, it didn't surprise me at all. And uh, it just speaks to the type man that Munch is. And he's three seasons, and uh, the Steelers line has benefited greatly. Le'Veon Bell has made a bunch of money uh, because of the way that O-line is uh, blocking for him and opening holes. And, um, you know, if, if that Le'Veon Bell's smart at all, he should uh, make sure they take care of Mike Munchak as the, uh, and keep him there as the O-line coach. And Bruce, you, you've written a book titled Inside the NFL's First Family, My Life of Football, Faith, and Fatherhood. Talk about what you wrote about in your book. Right. Uh, it, it, it's really been a neat experience for me. Um, my wife, Carrie, and I uh, kind of told our story of uh, just growing up in the NFL and, for that matter, my story of growing up as a Matthews. And we've been blessed that uh, we've had eight members in our family playing the NFL. And it's been a really neat thing for my brother Clay and my dad, my dad Clay Sr. to see this next generation kind of taking over the Matthews name and establishing an identity for themselves. Um, it's something that they're very proud of. And like my brother Clay and I have talked, it's something that we enjoy watching. And, um, and, and through that journey, kind of my faith in Jesus Christ and, um, how that developed and a lot of the relationships that uh, I developed playing football and really the fact that I've learned so many life lessons through this game. And I know there's uh, there's a lot of stuff going around in terms of uh, injuries, brain injuries, things of that nature. Bo Jackson said recently that uh, had he knew – then what he knows now he wouldn't have played and i get that i i understand that uh the game isn't for everyone but i know that uh for me that there were so many valuable life lessons that i learned and i know that my boys have learned and i i'm just thankful for the game i'm thankful for the opportunity and that being said i think the league is doing a much better job in terms of uh, their concussion protocol, taking care of injuries and um, making sure guys get the attention or, and maybe medical help that they need when they get older. But uh, really, it's just an opportunity to hopefully encourage people um, 
through telling my story. And there's a lot of things that I talk about in the book in terms of um, dealing with depression, um, dealing with a special needs child, uh, dealing with those those struggles and um, trials that we all go through, regardless of whether we're NFL football player or not. We're all going through something, and it's hopefully to offer encouragement through my faith and kind of telling the story of the Matthews family. Bob, more for Bruce? Bruce, uh, mind-boggling is the fact that 18 out of your 19 seasons, you played every game. And uh, it's almost crazy for me to say that, especially these days when it's uh, injuries are so much part of the game. But And your brother was like that. Your nephew's like that. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Is it is it a genetic thing with your family, Bruce? I know you all worked hard, but to be that um, – to 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 be able to withstand the rigors of a season that many times, it has to be a little bit more than just working hard. There had to be something in that family that goes beyond the weight room. Yeah, no question. Um, and I, I thought about it a lot, and um, especially since I retired and got into coaching, and you just observe and you see these freakish accidents where – Guys will fall into a, the side of a guy's leg and, um, you know, the guy ends up tearing his ACL or something. And it, and it looks so trivial when it happens. And I know there were so many times on film where, I mean, I get blown up and I'm thinking, oh, that, that definitely was it. And I get up and I'm no worse aware. Um, I got to attribute it to the good Lord. He gave us bodies, my brother Clay and I, and, and for that matter, the next generation of boys that can just take the pounding and um we can recover for the most part and um i'll be i in my 18th year i remember thinking um man i i feel really good i remember just thinking how crazy it was to be kind of having that mental conversation and i remember uh i got a turf toe right after that and I was thinking, all right, I'll, I'll get, I'll recover like I always do. And I came back the next season for my 19th year. And usually what happened is later in the, in my career, especially when we went up to Tennessee, that in the hot months, I'd kind of struggle. And it took me a while to kind of get my uh, game going. But then once the temperature dropped and um, I'd start feeling it, my, my game kind of took off. And it just didn't happen in my 19th year. I got a couple injuries, but again, I didn't miss any time. But uh, it there were a lot of other factors too in terms of my kids getting older and um, moving back and forth between uh, Houston and Nashville, and it just was time. Uh, and plus, I I had tied my brother in years played. I had always kind of <laughs> said in the back of my mind, "Hey, I want to play as many years as my brother." And last one from me, Bruce, I wanted to ask you about the versatility of the offensive line because you played every position, uh, which is another thing that, that you have to be commended for. Uh, what was, I have a feeling I might know the answer to this, but what was, was there a difference, a major difference between playing on one side of the line as opposed to the other? And was center the toughest one as far as a, uh, as far as both physical and a mental position to play? Uh, I, yes, definitely there was an adjustment when you switch sides of the ball. And um, the biggest thing was just suddenly you had to understand with your body in terms of uh, leverage and uh, how you block guys, especially in pass protection, where the quarterback was going to set up. And if you were playing on the right side, your right side of your body was trained to do it that way, and your left side was, um, without getting too specific, um, was doing it. And then all of a sudden when you went over to the left side of the ball, suddenly both those sides had to switch their responsibility. And, um, you know, for me, I always felt like, I, w I was proud when uh, the coaches asked me if I wanted, or not if I wanted, 
said they were going to um, switch me because I thought, and, and my dad was very clear about teaching us, hey, whatever the coach tells you, you do it. And it was always my belief, hey, if they want me to, to switch positions, then they think this will help the team have a better shot of winning. And I'm thinking to myself, man, that's all I'm about. I, I want to win, you know. And far be it for me to to say, hey, I ain't going to switch just so I can stay comfortable. But, uh, no, the, each position really had their challenge, their very unique challenges. And um, there were pluses and minuses in terms of, like, difficulty. I mean, you play on the edge, a tackle, you're going to face some of the most elite athletes. Now, they, they might be lighter and not as heavy, uh, but they can run. They're athletic. They can embarrass you if your technique's jacked up at all. And then as you move to the inside, it becomes more physical, more uh, – you, you've just got to be willing more to, to, to have a stalemate because in a lot of uh, scenarios – a stalemate was a win. If you covered your guy up and let Eddie George have the opportunity to make a cut, then you were successful on that play. Um, I love playing center, too. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I I loved uh, throwing the ball, catching it, kicking it, punting it. And if they let me snap it and make the calls, I enjoyed it. I, I love at least having that little bit of control out there and um, but like I said, I, I really enjoyed playing every position. And like I said, I, I always considered it an honor if they asked me to switch positions. Bruce, just a couple more before we let you go. We had um, Bruce Davis on the show last week. He played his last two seasons with you in Houston back in the late 80s. And last week he told us that he credits himself with your making it into the Hall of Fame because he saved you from having to play left tackle so you could stay <laughs> on the inside. So agree with that? Was it, was it, was it Bruce Davis who got you into the hall? Uh, yeah, he, he definitely, uh, he, he had a role because I was holding out in 87. Those were the only games I missed when I held out that year. And in the meantime, they traded to the Raiders and got Bruce Davis and plugged him in at left tackle. Then I finally came and uh, I missed over half the season. When I came back in, he was doing well, and uh, they moved me back to guard. And um, There might be some truth there, definitely. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't argue when they moved me back inside, put it that way. <laughs> now, Bruce, Bruce was a, a great player, very smart player. I really enjoyed uh, – um, hearing his perspective on the mental part of the game. And, um, yeah, and then uh, absolutely loved all his Raiders stories. And, um, you know, he he had what all of us on the Oilers wanted, and that was a, a world championship opportunity. And um, he, had, he had been there. He had seen the mountaintop. Yeah. And, Bruce, we had Bubba McDowell on the show a couple of weeks ago, and, and I asked him about his emotion, uh, emotions watching this year's Super Bowl because you were both with the Oilers in 93 when you had that, you know, 35-3 to lead over the Bills in the divisional round that let that get away. And I asked Bubba if he could see the same thing, you know, starting to happen, you know, that happened to you guys, happened this year to the Falcons in the, in the Super Bowl. And, and it, you know, asked him, did it feel eerily familiar as you were sort of watching it unfold in this year's Super Bowl, and he said yes, that it you know he could he could reach back to some of those same emotions, and he could started to see it slip away like it slipped away from you guys. Is that true for you? Could you start to watching that Super Bowl? Could you start to feel like, yeah, I can name that tune in three notes? Yeah, unfortunately, yes, I could. Um, you know, my son Jake is a left tackle for the Falcons, so we were at the game, and we were living in. Um, you know, up and down on everything. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> about midway through the qu third quarter, Tom Brady took over. And it, it it's so funny because, um, you know, every year at playoff time, NFL Films will rerun that, that comeback game. And I always, when watching the first half and 
Bubba's pick six and to start the second half, I always feel like, man, I, I know we're going to lose this game, but something about it, I feel good about this. Uh, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll change. And, um, but I, day it's, uh, it's like so bittersweet because I get a, a little taste of the old feeling that I had in the first half of that Buffalo game. And, you know, with the Falcons and Jake, uh, it was difficult. It, it, it was hard to watch. All you could do was tip your hat to Tom Brady and Coach Belichick and the Patriots. They did an outstanding job of hanging in there. And um, Yeah, but it definitely there, – there's that element of the game, whether you call it momentum or whatever the case may be, where – and I, I remember sitting on the bench in the Buffalo game. I, I go, all right, we're, we're either going to get a stop or we're going to score – and we're going to end this madness, and it just didn't happen. And it's such an amazing dynamic, especially when you're sitting there and trying to experience it firsthand. Bruce, before we let you go, let our listeners know, how can they follow you, whether it's online or over social media, and keep up to date with the great things you're doing, and let them know again how they can get a copy of your book. Right. I'm on Twitter. I'm not a huge Twitter guy at the Matthew 74 and you can get uh, my book wherever books are sold. You can go online to amazon.com. And uh, I, I think people will enjoy it. Uh, if not only for the NFL part of it, but uh, like I said, it, it was my goal in writing this book to help kind of encourage people going through stuff. Cause like I said, we're all going through something. If not, we're fixing to be. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's, uh, I've enjoyed it. Oh, very much. Thank Our you, pleasure. Bruce. We appreciate you coming on, and we hope you'll uh, come back again soon. So many things we'd love to get your thoughts and insights on, but thanks for being a part of the show tonight, and uh, we can't thank you enough. All right. Thank you all. Good night, yeah, Bruce. Bruce. All right. Good night. At the uh, former Houston Oilers Hall of Fame guard, Bruce Matthews, and again, His book is called Inside the NFL's First Family, My Life of Football, Faith, and Fatherhood. It's available on Amazon.com. Eight reviews, all five stars. So clearly it's outstanding and needs to be on uh, everyone's list. And, Bob, what an honor to have uh, Bruce as part of the show tonight. I'm kind of speechless, Chris, because, you know, whenever we think of families that played in the NFL, uh, the Matthews family probably doesn't, it's not probably the first one that comes to mind. You automatically probably think of the Mannings and maybe some others, but uh, there is no no comparison, Chris. When you think about that family, what they've done in the NFL, his brother and him, 19 years apiece, and they uh, they played on the you know the line. They they were both linemen. I mean, this is just amazing. We know about Clay Matthews, Green Bay, how he's going on with the blue collar type of attitude, but um, my goodness, how his brother is not in the Hall of Fame. I urge everyone out there, just go to Pro Football Reference, check out Clay, his stats, what he did, and what Bruce said was an amazing fact, Chris. He was so versatile that he will not shine in one area, but that was one of the best linebackers all around I've ever seen, and he's not in the Hall. Yeah, no, what a great player he was, and the whole Matthews family, to this point, eight players? Eight kids in the family or, you know, from his father on down, make it in the NFL. What are the odds on that, Bob? Holy smokes. That's insane. Insane. All right. Uh, we, we're going to go off here and have a word from our friends over at Coastal Orthopedics. And we've got uh, Michael Brooks and Jeff Reed uh, on tap to, uh, to share with you here in the rest of the second hour. So hang with us. Are you suffering from chronic pain in your shoulders, hips, knees, or wrists? Tired of living life with an old injury that just won't go away? If you answered yes to either of these questions, we can help. At Coastal Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Dr. Candelora and his fine staff of medical professionals will get you back on the road to recovery. Their state-of-the-art facility and attention to detail will ensure you will be enjoying life again and feeling invincible in no time. Since 1991, Dr. Candelora and Coastal Orthopedics have been specializing in joint replacement, arthritis, and osteoporosis care, as well as pediatric and adult general orthopedics. Visit us on the web, www.bone-dr.com, or call our Newport Ritchie office just north of Tampa at 727-848-1417. 
proud sponsors of Mike Ditka's The Gridiron Greats Assistance Fund. Hey, we're back here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like Michael Brooks is going to be able to join us tonight. We've got Jeff Reed coming up here in just a few minutes. So in the meantime, Bob, I want to go back and get your thoughts on a couple of other things going on around the league right now. And uh, one of the stories that uh, kind of jumped out at me this week is for the first time since 1998, Ryan Leaf is uh, going to be at the Combine. And if you can believe it, he is there to help mentor some of the young quarterbacks. So, Bob, could we see Ryan Leaf starting to pull, our, our, like our friend, pull a Tony Collins, helping the young guys understand what not to do? Well. You know, I hadn't heard that name in a while, but uh, those who remember when he came into the league in 98, Chris, uh, second overall overall pick, you remember, it was huge, uh, who he would go to. And um, I don't know if you look back in NFL history, and I'm sure there are some, but I don't know if there has ever been so so much of a highly touted player who only played three years in the league. And we're not talking having lost time to a devastating injury. It was just, uh, it, it was like his game, his personality just did not fit in the league, Chris. Only played a total of uh, 30, 25 NFL games, I believe, uh, after being a first-round draft pick. Um, everything just went downhill for that guy, Chris. I, uh, you felt sorry uh, because the ta- he, he was just the, the prototypical quarterback that they model people after six foot five, about 240 pounds at the time out of Washington state. They thought he was uh, another drew Bledsoe from that same area. They thought he was going to be much better than Bledsoe. And, uh, but it's interesting that uh, you bring it up as far as in a mentoring position, maybe a guy that and he's undergone some awful things uh, to have uh, experienced what I just mentioned. Uh, maybe he comes out of it and, and can throw some good upon some other players, Chris, uh, because this is a guy that, you know, <laughs> if you, you wanted to talk Hall of Fame coming out of college, he would have been, been the guy you'd say he's got a shot. He's got that talent, the size, and everything. And I guess it's a lesson in life, Chris. It's, it's not automatic. You can't mail things in. And uh, hopefully what you said, things some some good might come out of this. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's interesting, Bob, you know, to think that, you know, here Ryan Leaf is, right, you know, to your point, you know, so highly touted. Remember, the Colts were, you know, wrestling with themselves. Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf, Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, he certainly had, you know, a lot of trials and tribulations that he, that he went through. So it, it's interesting to kind of see him here. I'd love to get him on the show, you know, kind of, you know, I, I think of him, and, and again, it's only this one story, so, you know, it, it would bear more research. But, you know, as, you know, our good friends, you know, Tony Collins certainly is, is very near and dear to us. And Tony had his struggles. And look what, what a wonderful, you know, things. Look at all the wonderful things Tony's doing now. Right. EJ Jr. had his struggles. What wonderful things he's doing now. Our good friend Tim Worley, you know, the struggles that he had and the wonderful things that he is doing. It would be interesting, you know, for me to, for us both, I guess, to understand, you know, it, is Ryan looking at, you know, all of the mistakes that he made? And here he is now trying to mentor these young guys again, you know, with the, here's what not to do. You know, here's all the things that I did. Don't do this. Right. So, and here's how it happened. And here's, you know, the, the path that I got on. And here's how I got on it and, and all of those sorts of things. So it would, it would be really interesting to have him on the show to understand, you know, I, you know, his life and the things that, you know, how it got, you know, sidetracked and, and now, you know, coming back here at the combine and trying to teach uh, the young quarterbacks, like I say, about all the things not to do. So uh, it's an interesting story, and hopefully we get the opportunity at some point to have Ryan as part of the show. All right, before we get to our next guest, Jeff Reed, I want to give a shout-out to our good friend, Renee Schell, over at Career Engagement Institute. Folks, if you're out there and you're upside down in your career, and what do we mean by that? You're ready to move on and go do something else. Well, go to careerengagement.institute online to see how Renee can help you. You've heard some of our guests here on TNT, like our TNT Hall of Famer, Toy Cook, singing Renee's praises here on the show. And if you work with Renee for two minutes, you're going to understand exactly why Toy and our other our other uh, guests, and Bob and I as well, brag about Renee every single week here on Thursday Night Tailgate. When you're ready to make a job move, you want you know to work with someone who you can trust, 
who actually has your best interests at heart, and you know it's very rare to find somebody like that. Well, no one fits that description any better than Renee Schull does. She's a wonderful person, the exact kind of person that you want to work with and have working for you. She's doing some great things from some of our guests who have been in transition from being pro athletes and are now getting into the job market. Folks, I'm telling you, Renee is just the very best. There isn't a better, better way to describe her than that. If you're an athlete or anyone in the job market, do yourself a favor and reach out to Renee. You're going to be so very glad that you did. Go to careerengagement.institute online and give her a follow on Twitter, at Integrated Play. All right, now back with us on the Kyvin Foods guest line and making his fifth appearance on the show with us is former Steelers kicker Jeff Reed. Let me give you some background on Jeff. He's from Kansas City, Missouri. He played his college ball at the University of North Carolina, where he didn't kick in a college game until he was a junior back in the year 2000. That season, he was named an academic All-ACC player and a finalist for the Lou Groza Award, which is given annually to the nation's top kicker. He was an undrafted free agent signed by the New Orleans Saints, but uh, spent most of his career in Pittsburgh kicking for my Steelers, and he uh, kicked in the NFL from 2002 until 2011, had a cup of coffee with the 49ers and the Seahawks as well. And over the course of his career, he accounted for 959 points, 919 of them as a Steeler, which ranks second all-time on their points list behind only Gary Anderson. Jeff has hosted his own show called Barely Controlled Radio, which you can find on iTunes, plus you can uh, find a link to it on our site, ThursdayNightTailgate.com as well. And we're excited that Jeff is back with us again here on TNT. Hey, Jeff, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, what's up, guys? How you doing? Thanks for having me. Good, Jeff. How are you? Good. Good, man. I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, I've, I, you guys obviously plan way ahead, and I do this. So I have no call around my office to make sure I don't forget because I get sidetracked in my in my uh, my new job. I guess it's not new anymore, but I'm still at work and was about to walk out, looked at the clock, and said, "Oh crap, 9:25 is right around the corner." So, uh, you know, that's it's where I, I, I mean, I remind myself 12 times a day, and I still almost forgot. So I don't know if I can blame a concussion on that or a lack of intelligence. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that you made it, my friend. Always good to have you back and part of the show, Jeff. Always, man. So, sure. so uh, Jeff, you know, like so many kickers, you were a soccer player growing up, and uh, you know, I, w- one of the things that uh, sort of made me scratch my head this year as a Steeler fan was watching Chris Boswell, who's you know the current Steelers kicker, and he tried to pull off a kind of a crazy onside kick where he sort of passed passed in front of the ball and tried to kick backwards, you know, with his left foot. He pulled it off to his credit in college, but uh, unfortunately failed miserably, you know, doing it here for the Steelers. I'm curious to get your thoughts. Were you surprised to see Mike Tomlin let him try to pull that off in the NFL? Yeah, hi, I was. But I mean, here's the thing about onside kicks: even if you're, uh, even if you kick it perfect, the chances of you getting there, you know, it's probably one in five. I mean, it's just the way you, when you're playing against those athletes. I mean, I think more than the team itself, I think he's probably more embarrassed than anybody because Coach Tomlin would have never let him do it if he never did it in practice. So I know regardless of his college days, he's obviously shown he can do something along those lines in practice or Coach would never uh, let him do it. Because I, I did a lot of things too, and we used about half of what, what I tried and experimented with in practice in the game. So, um, I, I mean, I, it, is, it is what it is. I mean, if he, if he lands that, hits the skyrocket and Pittsburgh gets the ball, you know, he's like, it's like the coolest thing in the world. If he does what he did, you look at it and say, why the heck did they try that? So you can't win either way. And to that point, Jeff, you know, talking about onside kicks and practicing that sort of thing, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly a talent, right? To try to figure out, you know, where on the ball to kick it, how to make it, you know, go so far, bounce up in the air, all that sort of thing. Talk about how hard it is to try to pull off and kick it just right and get that thing to, to bounce the way you need it to bounce. Well, for years it is. It's very tough. Um, for years I just kind of did the old kick the ball with the kind of your toe at the bottom of your shoe. You have three hopper. Hopefully the first two are low. The third one takes a huge hop or it's going so it, it messes with the uh, receiving team so bad, it hits them in the shins, you get the ball. Um, then, you know, it was it was starting to get pretty inconsistent, so everyone was trying different stuff, and uh, I even went to where I was kicking a left-footed sometimes, and I wouldn't say that was the prettiest sight, but it did fool some teams. Um, but then I learned from uh, Toby Gowen back when I was with the Saints. I was there with uh, – he was the punter and kickoff guy. John Carney was the kicker when I first started, and also Orlando Mare. Um, he perfected that one, that huge high hop. 
And uh, I never quite kicked it as high as them, I don't think. Um, but I tell you what, when you hit that right, I mean, it is purely a jump ball. So um, that was, I thought, was always the most effective, but you did have to hit it right. And, Jeff, a couple of seasons ago, now former Vikings kicker Blair Walsh had a tough go and, you know, kind of pole hooked a 27-yard field goal in that sub-zero temperatures up there in Minnesota that would have won a playoff game over over Seattle. And now, you know, he came back last season un, you know, a little inconsistent with the Vikings. They end up letting him go. But ironically, the Seahawks have signed him as a replacement for Steven Hauska, who looks like he's going to be moving on and signing with the Buffalo Bills. Curious to get your thoughts, Jeff. You, you've mentioned in the past about, you know, how some kicks they, that you miss still bother you. Would it be even, you know, more of a consistent reminder? Would it bother you even more if now you're the kicker for the team that, you know, you ended up, uh, you know, having your biggest miss come against? Um, you know, initially when he first gets there, he's probably already there by now, but uh, when he first gets there, they're going to be thanking him and giving him a hard time. But in the end, he's now on their roster. Um, he's going to be their kicker, so they will welcome him. I played with a bunch of those guys when they were rookies and young. Uh, Cam Chancellor, uh, Sherman, um, you know, all, all those guys I played with, and not all, but a, a good majority of them. And they're they're very welcoming. They're fun to play for, fun to play with, and uh, it's a tight knit team. That's why they're successful. Um, but you know, there are going to be some jokes. I mean, there always are. I mean, when I got there. You know, there was only, I think there were only two guys on that team, a fullback and another, and a defensive back that were on the Super Bowl team when we beat, when we beat them in Super Bowl 40 in Detroit. And they were giving me a hard time, but really it, it was kind of in my favor as opposed to this situation. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure they'll give him a hard time. Um, but, but in the end, um, it's probably cool that he, he now knows that, uh, he's got, he's got a new team and, um, someone that believes in him. Bob, questions for Jeff? Jeff, we've talked in the past about the the toughness of special teams. And a guy like yourself, you spent a lot of time in the weight room and you weren't afraid to mix it up. I was just wondering, do you remember specifically, Jeff, the uh, the time that you got hurt the most on a football field? Uh, because you really never missed any games kicking. But I'm sure there was times where you took shots where you say, maybe I probably shouldn't have done that, you <laughs> know. Yeah, for the most part, I try to keep my nose out of things. Um, the, every once in a while, your adrenaline takes control of that. I mean, you had guys like hmm. Neil Rackers and Todd Stauber and those guys trying to, you know, knock somebody's head off every kick, which I don't quite understand. But um, and they ended up on their backs a lot. But I, uh, I know my role. I was the last line of defense. If anything, if it comes down to me, I got to make sure they, uh, I shield them out of bounds or make them at least cut back so we have a chance to get them with our safeties. But um, there is one time I'll never forget, and I saw it coming actually. And it was, I had three concussions when I played in the NFL. I didn't have any in college, and one for, one was from hitting my head trying to make a tackle in Baltimore on that turf. Uh, one was from getting my bell rung, which wasn't so bad, but still a minor concussion. And the time I'm talking about against the Browns, one of my own buddies, uh, Josh Cribs, and he had a linebacker, uh, what was his name, Sean Thompson, I believe, um, that was blocking for him, and it. It was a nasty game, ugly, uh, raining, muddy, and they said, just do not kick it in the air and let him return it. Just hit a squib, and it bounced over his head, landed, stopped on the half-yard line. So I knew for sure we were going to tackle him inside the 5 or 10, and all our guys went down there, slipped all over the place, missed 10 tackles, and then here I come, uh, thinking that it was pretty much the play was over, and that was just me and him. And uh, the linebacker, I saw him coming. I tried to get Josh to go out of bounds. He pretty much leaped over me, and I got destroyed by Sean. And uh, I was, you know, I, I don't remember really playing. Uh, I don't remember uh, kicking a couple more kicks that I made that game. So um, that didn't necessarily hurt, but that was uh, probably the hardest I've ever been hit. And, uh, Jeff, the last time we talked, we brought up the – and it's been a great – topic of conversation on the show is the extra point and uh, now that you've seen another season of it uh t tell us what your thoughts are it did make a difference in a lot of strategy it did cost some teams some games uh are you still a fan of it and just give us an overall uh, uh outlook of it right now uh i don't know i can't say i'm a fan of it because i'm a kicker and we you know as extra points you yeah, I mean it's a lot. E it's a lot easier to make 20 yard field goals than 33, um, especially if there's a penalty or something after the play. 
Um, a lot of times they would just take it on the kickoff. Now they actually push the extra point back 15, 15 yards or something to make it a 48 yarder. But, uh, Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it at all. I mean, I think it's, I mean, a kicker in the NFL, even a kicker in college should be able to make, um, you know, 95% of those kicks. So I think it has taken a, uh, it has changed the game a little bit, which is nothing wrong with that. I'm just waiting for the time that, you know, any field goal over 45 counts as four points and anything over 55 counts as five. <laughs> so those games there that you go. have to, so those games that you have to, you know, you're down by four, you don't have to score a touchdown. You have to get to 37 and kick a field goal for four or five points. Um, that's what I'm waiting for. Um, as a kicker, that would bring us even more involved in games that are close, and you wouldn't have to score a Hail Mary. Uh, you could actually have a chance to tie the game from, you know, 48 yards or so. Has anyone ever talked about that? Is that, is that anything that someone in the league has ever mentioned as a, as a consideration? I don't think so. I, I talk about it all the time when I ha- hear questions like this, and – a lot of people think I'm joking, um, but I, I truly think. I mean, I don't want. I don't think it should turn into a circus of a game. But you know, a lot of times, if you if you got 10 seconds left and you're on your own 40, and you can get 15, 20 yards, you can tie the game with four points, five points, um, and that would be kind of. I think it would be very interesting as compared to just the hail mary. That although some teams have scored on hail marys, it's very rare. Uh, so I I don't know. I, I'm a kicker too, so that's my perspective. I think that's a different way to approach the game. If you're going to change the extra points, change change everything. Um, you know, I, I just that's just the way I look at it uh, as far as as, as far as kicking because I know fans would enjoy that as well. Um, Hail Marys are cool, and everybody likes to do that when they're throwing around with their friends and in practice, the last day of practice. But um, the bottom line is, I think fans would be really into a four or five point field goal. And Jeff, when you're lining up for a kick or if you're just standing there, you know, after a team has tried to ice you, being, you know, calling a last second timeout and you're waiting for the, 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 you know, play to resume, are guys on the opposing team, are they trash talking you? Are they trying to get in your head? Yeah, I don't think there's, uh, you know, when I, when somebody calls a timeout, I just kind of walk away from everything, including my own teammates. Um, it's not really a time for discussion with me. Uh, it's, it's a time for, this is what I get paid to do. So focus, make sure you're loose, make sure you're ready, make sure you find some good grass. Uh, so that's the advantage of somebody trying to ice you. You can find a better spot, um, unless it's on turf, of course. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you always hear stuff. You hear people barking. You hear people, you know, that you've known that play on different teams that have a story about you. You know, you hear it. Uh, it's just a matter of if it affects you or not. So it's uh, I mean, it's fun. It's part of the game. I mean, it's trash talk. People get um, you know, say it's ridiculous and this and that, but it, it's part of any sport. It doesn't matter. I don't know about, about golf necessarily, but I'm sure every once in a while somebody sneaks something in on one of the walks to the green. So um, it's just, it's a part of competition. It's part of the sport. And yeah, to answer your question, it, it, were very, it was very rare if it did not happen. And Jeff, you had a number of game-winning field goals. I'm particularly fond of the one that that you had back in September of 2008 to beat the Ravens in overtime. Do, do you feel pressure every time in that moment, or after you've been through it the number of times that you had gone through it? Does it no longer bother you? Uh, if anyone says it no longer is pressure, it's just it's routine. They're lying. Um, I was always known as a guy that I would much rather kick a game winner than you know, eight field goals in a game. That's just me. Um, it wasn't because I didn't want to get the 24 points. It was just that I, I, I thrive and strive on pulling my team through after they'd been through a hard fought game. And there's only one time I failed at that, and that was in, in Chicago. And I'll never forget that game, even though it was a very ugly game for me. And we lost by a game winner by Robbie Gold. So, um, but I do remember a lot of the makes, of course. Um, but that one always sticks out in my head because I want to back, but I also know I'm not going to get that opportunity back. So um, I, I, I enjoyed them. Uh, of course, it's nerve wracking. Of course, your adrenaline gets going once your team crosses the 50, and you know, you know, this could be the biggest. The biggest thing that happened to me is when at Super Bowl 43, we were absolutely killing Arizona. They ended up taking the lead with five minutes left in the game, and you know, we had a third and I don't know, third and six or so from 33 yard line. Um, and if, if we don't get that, we're down by three points, 23 to 20. I have to tie the game in the Super Bowl with two and a half minutes left from 51 yards with a torn hamstring that nobody knew about. So 
Um, that was that was interesting because you know it was one of those games where I told the offense, please get in the end zone. I'm hurting, but I'm not, I'm sure as heck not gonna miss this game. Um, but I kicked well. Nobody knew it. My body knew it. I knew it. But um, we got a first down. Ended up San Antonio and gets his uh, gets his toes on a blade of grass at the very end. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. But that was one of those situations I didn't get an opportunity to kick. Where I mean that that would have made it. You make or break a you know a ring uh, on my, the second ring on my finger. So rewind a second. Now you had a torn hamstring. Did any was anyone aware of the torn hamstring? Of course, the coaching staff and the trainers. But uh, they have some uh, they have some good powerful things that you can um, take before a game that's not going to skew your mind or it's going to help your help your pain. So. Um, yeah, it was it, it was uh, not completely torn, or else I wouldn't be able to walk. Uh, but it was it was partially torn, hanging on by a thread, and and that was actually through the entire playoffs. And I kept that between the head coach, my special teams coach, and the uh, trainer. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to be on injury report. I didn't want anything. I just said, you know, if I can't kick, I'll be honest, but I'll be damned if I'm going to miss any of these games. So, um, luckily, it worked out for me. But then I had to get some. Uh, it wasn't necessarily surgery, but I had to get some serious work done in the offseason. And Jeff, we had Kerry Davis on the show last week, and I asked Kerry, you know, about you know kissing the Lombardi Trophy because Mike Tomlin always liked to refer to it as the sticky Lombardi because of all the Gatorade yeah. and the saliva and the fingerprints and the dirt all over that thing. What condition was the Lombardi in when you got your hands on it? Uh, I mean, it was similar. Um, I was a captain, so luckily for me, I was next to Hines at the time when we got handed the trophy, and I, I got a I got a piece of it early. Once it got to the airplane the next day, though, that was interesting. Who knows what was on that? Um, but <laughs> then again, it's a it's a Lombardi Trophy, so who cares? <laughs> you can always <laughs> clean it. So uh, yeah, you don't you don't really think about it when you're passing around an airplane and you know having a few drinks and uh, having a good time with people's families. Uh, that's a memory, two memories, because I want them both um, that I'll never forget. And nobody can ever take from me no matter what happens in life. So uh, it's, it's a really cool feeling. But to be honest, it obviously wasn't the clean, shiny Lombardi you see in a in a facility of a, game, of a team that wins. But it is something that you'll uh, cherish and realize that you, you were a part of something special at some point. Bob, one more for Jeff before we let him go. Yeah, sure, Jeff. I mean, throughout your career in Pittsburgh, of course, you kicked in some incredibly tough conditions, I should say, and uh, some long field goals. On a typical bad weather day, Jeff, when you were asked to go kick one maybe above 40 degrees, did you get a lot of help from special team coaches or coaches in general as to wind conditions, et cetera, or did they pretty much leave that up to you? They left it up to me. I told them before every game, uh, no matter which Mm -hmm. coach I played for, they say, what's what's your distance this way, what's your distance this way, and and every pretty much every home game we had, I said, well, we'll see where the wind's going because I can't really tell you, you know, right? I, you know, it just depends on the kick, depends on the situation, um, you know, because the wind was swirling in Heinz Field, but more often than not, you have a little bit of wind behind you, a little bit to the right going towards the open end. I'm sure it hadn't changed much, um, but every game, what do you feel coming from, from this way, this way, this way, this way, and uh, – they left it up to me. And then once it was, you know, second down and we second and eight, we're on the 35. They're like, you know, unless we get sacked here, we, you, uh, you make it and I'll say yay or nay. And I was honest, you know, there were certain games where it was a 40 mile an hour win. You're not going to kick a 50 yard field goal when that's in your face. And it's just stupid. It's better off to punt it and, you know, play, play our, you know, have such a good defense, play defense. But, um, it was pretty much up to me. I mean, there, there's always some of those opinions that, they thought really mattered because, but they're not the ones kicking. So they, uh, they kind of left it at that, at that, at that level, even a little bit in most of the time in college, um, they leave it up to the kicker himself. So that was good. Jeff, before we let you go, let our listeners know, you know, what you're doing now and how they can follow you online or over social media. Well, Twitter is, is definitely me. I don't know why it doesn't have the little check mark, whatever that thing means. Um, it's uh, I, I control all my social media. Um, it's at the real Jeff Reed. Um, I, I put a lot of stuff on there, but I do more stuff on Facebook. Um, I know it says I can't accept any more friends. I don't think I'm that popular, but it does say that. 
Um, so, so you know, I, I hope that a lot of people are my followers already, and then I can add more as they uh, come up on my screen to click on. But right now, I've been in the car business for about a year and eight months. Uh, went through a rough time after football. Um, um, hit a state of depression. Um, battled a lot of different things that probably for a different show or, or for a documentary myself, which I'm working on. Um, but the bottom line is I had a friend that owns a car dealership and he's trying to get me a journalism job because that's what I majored in and that's what I love radio and TV. And, I and he, and it was all nine, it was all nine to five kind of things. Um, you know, 40,000 bucks, which I know is a lot of money to a lot of people, but coming from the NFL, I knew it wasn't going to be a doctor. So I was going to have to take a little bit of a cut, but I wanted something where I could earn a ton of money. And basically I, I was on the sales floor here at a Jeep dealership in Charlotte, which is Keffer Jeep. Um, it's a huge dealership. It was number one in the southeast of the United States. So, I mean, we sell a lot of cars. And sold 15 in one month, surprised myself, surprised the GSM, surprised the owner. Um, got sent to finance school. I was a finance manager for about a year. And just in January 1st, I got promoted to the uh, finance director. So, now I am the last line of defense of the dealership before it hits accounting. So, it's a huge responsibility, but it's something that I cherish, and that's why I'm still at work. You know, I got here at 9 this morning. Obviously, you see what time it is. I left last night at 11.45. Um, wow. I don't, you know, I'm sing I'm single. Um, I, You know, it's not like I have a, have kids and a wife to get home to or things would be different. Um, so right now, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm doing a different craft that never saw myself doing. And it's cool because I get to use my brain every day, even though a lot of, when you have a lot of employees, you know, you can be, uh, on edge with a few, but you got to learn to keep your cool. I'm, I've been a captain before, and that's basically what I am here. I have uh, five other finance managers. Um, me, the GSM, and the owner are the top people in the store, and we have 100 employees. So it's a pretty cool thing. I never saw myself, like I said, doing this, um, but it's uh, I enjoy I enjoy being around people. I enjoy talking with people. I mean, some are cooler than others, and some are nicer than others, um, but that's life. And uh, so that's where I'm at, you know, and then I have a good time. Um, I work, I work really hard and, uh, you know, my paycheck, uh, reflects that. There you go. Jeff, you are awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out of, you know, your long day that you put in at work to be a part of the show tonight. Uh, we always look forward to you coming back and sharing more of your stories and your insights with us. Thank you for, uh, for the, for tonight. And we hope you'll come back again real soon. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. You know, it's just a matter of a, a day from now, I'll have another good story. So whenever you guys need me. I'll uh, I'll be around and ready to go. Appreciate, Appreciate it, that, Jeff. Take care. We'll, right, we'll catch you. up with you again real soon, my friend. Thank you, guys. Take care. Good night. That is a uh, former Steelers kicker Jeff Reed, and uh, you know Bob. They, you know, one of the nicknames that they used to call Jeff Quadzilla because he had such big legs and uh, and the amount of weight that he was able to to press and squat and all of those sorts of things. And you, you want to talk about a guy that uh, I think could come off the, come off the bench right now and, uh, and kick for, you know, whoever, uh, you know, the Steelers or whatever team needed a kicker. I tell you, I, I bet you it would take Jeff a couple of weeks and he'd be out there and, uh, and making field goals again. Cause uh, you know, such outstanding shape that he was in and what a powerful leg he had. Yeah, we talked in the past about how nobody could outwork him in the weight room, Chris, and uh, and all those strong guys in Pittsburgh. But uh, his legs were as, as good as anyone's. But he has, still has that that lineman mentality. That's what we always liked about him. And uh, has a lot of great stories every time he comes on. And uh, hardworking guy, great personality, and uh, always enjoy having Jeff Reed on the show. Absolutely, and barely controlled radio. Was the, is the name of his show on iTunes. It's a great listen. I highly recommend uh, anyone go check it out on iTunes, and you can link to it right from our site as well, ThursdayNightTailgate.com. All right, when Bob and I come back, we'll be turning on our Thursday Night Tailgate Spotlight on the positive, hear which players are doing great things in their communities, and then we'll wrap up the show. We'll do all of that on the other side of these words from our friends over at Coastal Orthopedics and Kyven Foods. Are you suffering from ongoing pain from athletic injuries in your knees, shoulders, or hips? Tired of living your life with an old injury that just won't go away? If you answered yes to either of these questions, we can help. Dr. Peter Candelora and his experienced staff of medical professionals will get you back on the road to recovery. Their state-of-the-art facility and new medical technology will ensure you'll be enjoying life again in no time. Since 1991, 
Dr. Candelora has been specializing in joint replacement, athletic injuries, and general orthopedics. Visit us on the web at athleteinjuries.com or call our office at 888-825-1150. That is 888-825-1150. We're proud sponsors of the Gridiron Greats Assistance Fund. This is Reggie Kelly, former Cincinnati Bengals and Atlanta Falcon tight end. And I'm the owner of Kyvin Foods. And if you enjoy delicious food, you're going to love my Kyvin products, which consist of our honey apple salsa, sweet barbecue sauce, and an array of seasonings. For store locations, online orders, and recipes, check out our website at www.kyvan82.com. That's K-Y-V-A-N 82.com. One taste, and you'll appreciate the goodness. Hey, hey, welcome back. This is Todd Washington, two-time Super Bowl champ, offensive line coach for the Baltimore Ravens, and you are listening to Thursday Night Tailgate with my boys Chris Moscato and Bob Lazari on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Go get them, guys. And we're back here on Thursday Night Tailgate, and we're turning on our spotlight on the positive. Bob, who do you have for us this week? Chris, we talked tonight a lot about the uh, Houston Oilers, Tennessee Titans franchise. And, and speaking of the Titans, I, I came across the fascinating story of Jarrell Casey this week. And for those who don't remember, he's a very talented guy. He's been in the league about five, six years, plays defensive tackle, incredibly good player. And I wasn't fully aware of his background, Chris. Uh, his brother, uh, who actually was a couple years older than him, uh, was convicted of murder. This is about a decade ago, uh, when he was a teenager. And, uh, it, it really affected Jarrell in a, in a tough way. For years, he, he struggled with it. And, uh, to see his brother, a guy that he looked up to, uh, probably gonna die in prison some days. It's just an incredible story. But he was able to, uh, kind of reverse the, the whole mindset, Chris, and he, he vowed to be much different. And uh, off the field, he's truly done it, in, in addition to being a pro bowler. Uh, he, him and his wife have, have established called this, this Casey Fund. And it has to do with a lot of guys that are maybe coming out of uh, incarceration, nothing as serious as what his brother did, Chris. But, I mean, he does a lot of mentoring, uh, gets into the halfway houses, does a lot of good work as far as trying to get these guys to be productive and woman, uh, productive members of society again. So he is really into that. And of course, he has a, a bird's eye view of it, uh, seeing what it did for his brother. He's always v- also very, very involved in the United Way down in uh, Nashville. He gives a lot of free football camps, Chris. I've read about that, what he does uh, around holidays. He'll be the one out there passing away, uh, passing out turkeys. He's done a lot of that. But um, he's been at all of the uh, Titan community events and uh, all because of probably what happened in his family. But uh, kudos to him for turning it around because, Chris, he could have gone down the same type of path. And, and you know, but this is a guy who uh, was mentally strong to make it work. And uh, so kudos to Jarrell Casey tonight. Very good. And, Bob, this week I want to put the spotlight on Washington Redskins Pro Bowl defensive end Ryan Kerrigan. You know, back in 2013, he established his Blitz for Better Foundation to provide opportunities, support, and resources to children and families in need in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And the the prime focus of his foundation, Bob, is to provide, you know, support to seriously ill, special needs, and physically challenged children, you know, throughout that community. And he's got three programs that he runs. Kerrigan's Corner, which provides patients and their families access to electronics during their hospital stays, you know, electronics, you know, things for like entertainment, communication, things that can give a diversion, you know, to the kids during their treatment and their recovery. His second program is called Ryan's Reindeer Rush. You talk about, you know, what Jarell does, you know, passing out presents. Well, it's very similar here, Mm -hmm. which is a holiday program designed for children, you know, who might need a little extra holiday cheer. You know, every year since 2014, Ryan has visited the pediatric units and the hospitals around D.C. to deliver toys, you know, to, to kids during the holiday season. 2015, the program expanded to include a holiday party at the Redskins Park, you know, so they give, you know, holiday meal giveaways is very similar you're talking about giving away turkeys does those sorts of things as well 
And the third program that they have is called Positive Impact, which is just you know starting to get launched now, and it's going to provide financial assistance to, to families who are in need with you know severely you know and chronically ill children, you know, to help those kids with their special needs. It's going to be a financial sort of boost up, if you will, to allow the families to care for themselves, right, and enhance their financial stability to improve you know the whole family's quality of life because we know how you know how expensive these things can be. So. Kudos to Ryan Kerrigan for doing great things for seriously ill children and special needs kids in and around the uh, the D.C. area, Bob. Great stuff from both he and Jarrell. It is great, Chris. And uh, my goodness, again, we uh, we try to put such a spotlight on these guys because uh, it it goes it kind of gets brushed under the rug a lot. Uh, and uh, what's fascinating to me is when I look at a lot of these uh, nominees for the Peyton Man of the Year. Chris, it's almost as if every guy I read about, you say to yourself after the biography, you said, how could this guy not have won? And that's a great thing when you could have 30 guys like that. And that's just 30 that we know. We know there's so many more guys on each team that do so many good things. But uh, these guys are the top of the crop, and and they have a hands-on approach to it. It's not that they just have people working for them uh, and it's it's just so refreshing to end the show like we always do on that and uh i know we'll pick up the newspaper tomorrow and maybe the first thing we'll see in the sports section is some knucklehead uh in a nightclub and uh, we know the term athlete and nightclub never is a good combination chris but i'd rather i'd rather put the spotlight on these guys uh that are out there on a daily basis both during the season and the off season making a difference in their community uh, and i'm sure you feel the same Absolutely. All right, Bob, it is time for us to put a bow on this episode of Thursday Night Tailgate. We once again, we want to say thank you to Leonard Wheeler, Tony Collins, Bruce Matthews, and Jeff Reed for joining us tonight. And Bob, it, we had a little bit of a struggle at the top, but uh, always the best uh, to get to spend uh, my Thursday nights with you, my friend. Well, I appreciate you trying to fix that, Chris. Uh, you know, your technology skills are much better than mine. And uh, hey, we got to do a show and that's all that counts. That's right. All right. So who next week, who do we have scheduled to join us? And we hope you'll come back and be a part of the show with us because we're going to, we have for you former Dolphins, 49ers and Redskins fullback. Mark Logan will be making his TNT debut with us. Our good friend and uh, uh, BC Lions wide receiver, Marco Iannuzzi will be back with us. Great to be catching up with Marco. Former Patriots and Cowboys wide receiver Terry Glenn. It's been a long time since we've had Terry on the show, so we look forward to him coming back to here, coming back to join us yeah. here on TNT. And Gay Culverhouse, the daughter of uh, former Tampa Bay Buccaneers owner Hugh Culverhouse, will join us. Gay has uh, served as the uh, Bucks team president and president of Notre Dame, oh, by the way, for a few years. She's been very involved in the uh, concussion lawsuit, so it'll be great to hear what she's working on. So we look forward to having Gay as part of the show next week. And plus, of course, Tony Collins, who joins us every single week here on TNT, share more of his thoughts and insights with us. So we're going to have a lot of fun next week. We hope you'll come back and be a part of the show. How can you find us on social media? Well, visit us on Facebook. We've got a uh, Thursday Night Tailgate Facebook page, plus Bob and I both have our own individual Facebook pages as well. Give us a like. That's very important to us. On Twitter, you can find me at CT Mascaro. Bob is at Bob underscore Lazari, and the show is at TNT Podcast. You can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free folks by going over to Podbean. They've been so great to us. Really appreciate all their support. They have you know, had us as a recommended show both online and on their mobile app. Can't thank them enough for doing that. So they've got us featured front and center. So check us out there on Podbean. You can also find the show and stream it on great sites like iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Audio Boom, Player.fm, and SoundCloud as well. You can take us with you everywhere you go so you can you won't miss any of our episodes, right? Check us out on uh, any of your f- favorite uh, sites, you know, whether you're out and about and on your on your smartphone, you can listen to us. Take us with you if you're at the grocery store, the mall, wherever you might be. Tune in and listen to some of our great conversations with some of the greatest players in the history of the NFL. Bob, take us home, my friend. Thanks, Chris. And we also thank our announcer, Joe Lajanusa, for the great job he does with our weekly intro and ads. And to James Brocato, all the guys from Painted Faces for the upcoming outro music. On behalf of myself and Chris tonight, we thank everyone for listening. We appreciate you the most. Until next week, good night, Kevin. We miss you.